Hunt with passion. Never stop casting. Chase the dream. Welcome to Season 3 of Musky Mastery Outdoors. Sponsored by Joe Booker Outdoors. Number one in big game fish products. All right, guys. Welcome back to yet another late season vlog here on the Musky Mastery channel. This is Season 3, and I believe this is actually Episode 61 for Season 3, which is kind of crazy, but uh, the episodes are going to keep coming. If you guys want it, I'm going to keep developing content for you. And that's what this episode is actually all about. This is all about you guys, the users, the viewers, the subscribers to the Musky Mastery channel. Thank you for asking questions. And I really appreciate it. Um, it shows me that you guys are interested in this topic. And as a high school science teacher, I naturally want to dive in. So this uh, episode, if you will, is is all about user Q and A. So I really I went through uh, a couple different YouTube episodes that I recently put out on trolling and my actual video called you know the trolling basics, um, which I, I got some really great questions on. So that's the whole uh, point of today is to go over these questions and uh, I kind of mentioned this in a social media comment that if. If this format is enjoyable and you guys like hearing your comments uh, called out on on the uh, on the channel here, we'll do more of this this winter where we'll do kind of a Q&A style format where maybe I'll post a question and you guys can chime in on my community part of the YouTube channel and then I'll use that content to actually uh, build my, my vlog episode. So a lot of really cool things in that to talk about in the future, but let's dive right in here. This is a comment from Last Cast Angling, and he said, what is your favorite depth rater color? So we're gonna start off with color, and this, you know, my answer to this question, what's your favorite DR color? I mean, my favorite colors come and go. And I say that because it is all about confidence for me, at least in the late fall when it comes to trolling, and, and for that, a lot of different things come into mind when, when I'm thinking about this question, my favorite color. Because I, I mean, I guess I could tell you my favorite colors. I do have some favorite colors. I mean, those would be, and you guys have seen them in my videos, right? It's no, it's, it, you know, you can see it. It's Cracker Jack Tiger, so I love orange, uh, you know, Hunter orange um, in, uh, you know, in kind of that stained water flowages that I'm fishing. I love uh, the natural sucker color. So just a, a, a black uh, body with a white belly, maybe some red in the gill area. That's one of my favorites. Uh, blueback shad, so kind of a blue body with a white belly. And even the, the uh, Cracker Jack Tiger, the first color that I mentioned, has a white belly. So I like a lot of white bellies. Uh, but again, this fall, if you were to ask me what my favorite, like this fall of, of, of 2020, what's my favorite color this fall? Hey, I mean, Cracker Jack Tiger really came through, but my biggest fish of the fall, arguably, no doubt about it, was on Fire Tiger. And, you know, I really, why I started that question off with, it really varies quite a bit. It varies throughout the year. A couple things that I think of why I said that. One is that my confidence in a lure, as far as anything, you know, really when I'm talking, when we're talking trolling, the most important thing that has to be uh, answered first is does your lure track right, which is actually one of the one of the questions coming up. Does your lure actually track true? Does it track properly in the water column? Uh, does it tick the structure well? Does it does it hold um, its buoyancy over time over multiple fish? Is it actually buoyant? Is it doing what it's doing? So those things have to be present before I'm actually tuned in on a color. And all of these lures that are mass manufactured, it doesn't matter. You know what company it is there. You know that that's out there. I know they would admit this to you at least behind the scenes. All these lures, as much as we try to control, um, you know the, the the quality of these baits, they're always a little bit different. There's some that run a little deeper. There's some that run better. And so that's the first thing that I really look to. I a lot of times uh, from casting a depth rater during the you know primary part of my season in June, July, August, September, I will build a a uh, you know, a confidence in a certain color. Maybe that, you know, again, this this year, like like we've had some recent years, um, Grape Flame has been hot. So, and that's a little plug for JBO to come out with a Grape Flame uh, depth rater, which I'm really looking forward to. So again, um, I would say, generally speaking, again, I mean, my, you know, we're trolling so deep, generally speaking. So again, I'm down there. 
I mean, boy, we're trolling between 12 to 20, I mean, 20 feet down, right? How much light penetration is there 20 feet down? I don't know. Honestly, even as a science teacher, that's something I'd have to look into. So from that perspective, I don't know how, when, when, when my lure is tick and bottom in 16 foot, how much color the muskies are really able to see down there, if they're seeing any color down there at all. So more so what's important to me are rattles. And you guys know from watching my videos, the jointed model depth rater certainly seems to outproduce the straight model, not all the time, but a lot of times it's my confidence lure. So, you know, color preference again, to wrap that up, it really depends. I mean, again, I went with this fall, I, I fished a lot with Fire Tiger because I caught my first muskie on Fire Tiger on stained water. And I just said, hey, I'm going back to an old confidence color for me. And that's what got the job done on my biggest muskie of the fall. So I said, hey, it was a good call. It worked, uh, worked a long time ago, 20 some years ago, and it works now. So that's my answer on color. Okay, moving on here, guys. Next question, there were a lot of different folks that asked this. I'm just going to pick one. Illinois Muskie Hunter asks, you know, and, and uh, there are a variety of folks asked, what's the difference between holding the rod versus putting it in a rod holder? Is there a benefit to uh, doing it one way versus the other way? And there definitely is, and there's so much to go into on this topic. Uh, again, holding the rod versus putting the rod in the rod holder. The first thing is longevity. I mean, holy cow, when you're trolling for weeks and weeks straight, right? And you're spending, even in the fall when we have shorter days, you're spending, you know, six to eight hours on the water and you're trolling. You're not casting, you're trolling. Your shoulder, whatever your dominant shoulder is, it's holding that rod, it takes a beating. It's not just the shoulder, it's the forearm. It's the hand for gripping. It's the back, your lat muscles. Everything takes a beating. And, you know, as we all age, even myself, you know, I'm only 33, so I know I'm not that old, but I know enough to know. Talking to my good friends like Joe Booker, who's not old either. Joe, don't listen to this and get mad at me. But folks that have been in the game for a long time will tell you, you have to be safe with your body. You have to maintain your body. And even at a young age, I can feel it, uh, that you have to be careful doing this stuff. So, so I would say the benefit of the rod holder from where I'm kind of going with this conversation is that, hey, it takes a lot of the stress off the body. I bet some other uh, users comment that, yeah, I love trolling, but I couldn't hold my rod. And, that, and there's, there's a really important truth to that for all of us. It's the longevity factor. We want to musky fish for a long time. We want to, uh, you know, take care of our bodies and make sure that our shoulders and our, our uh, you know, our joints and everything lasts for a long time. But as far as which one is better from a, from a fishing perspective, fish catching perspective? That's a tough question. Um, I would say that, you know, the rod holder, the beauty of the rod holder, right, is that you can put multiple rods out where it is legal. And, you know, if you're only one person, you control two, three, four, five different lures. And you, don't, you can't obviously hold five rods. So the rod holder... The beauty in it, one of the beauties, one of the many, is that you're able to get more lures in the water and fish very effectively uh, via trolling without having to hold, you can't hold that many rods, right? Um, so that's one of the great benefits of the rod holder outside of the strain on the body, which we already talked about. Um, and I would say a second, you know, reason why the rod holder is fantastic is because, again, when you're when you're trolling over long stretches of water, I mean, it allows you to focus on your electronics even that much more so. So some of you folks that troll for, for long periods of time know that when you've got your rod in a rod holder, you can focus on your electronics, you can, you can do different things. For example, if you have a console and you have a steering wheel, it's really difficult to steer your boat and hold on to a, a fishing rod. Right, so that's where the rod holder is really a, ben a benefit to you. As a tiller guy, right, I have the the uh, the ability to steer my boat with one arm and have an arm free. So that's one of the reasons why I really prefer to hold the rod. But it gets better than that, though. Why do I hold the rod? Well, first of all, the strikes feel absolutely insane. You know, folks. So I got you know, a lot of folks. You know that I meet sometimes at trade shows, or whatever. They'll you know, oh, trolling's boring. Hey, let me tell you. When you get a strike and you're holding the rod and the boat's moving and the muskie, a big muskie pounds it, 
you feel it just or probably more than you've ever felt a casting strike. I mean, holy cow, it, it's it's absolutely incredible. It keeps me going. And uh, so, but I guess what I'm getting at is one of the advantages of holding the rod is the, that you have the feel on the lure that you wouldn't have if your rod is in the rod holder, right? So when I'm holding the rod, I can feel if the lure is running true. I can feel if my depth rater has snagged a weed. I can feel if I've snagged really even a small fish. How many of you folks out there have gotten your depth rater or, or any type of deep diving crankbait in after a long trolling run and you've either snagged a cisco, a perch, a smallmouth bass, a small pike, and you never knew it? The fish was too small to alert you that you actually had something on the other line. So holding the rod with your arm is really beneficial to feeling everything. When I'm ticking and clicking on the bottom, I can feel my lure working on the bottom. I know when I'm on the bottom, I know when I'm running clean. So there's a lot of, of really important things uh, with regard to feel that holding the rod is more beneficial to the rod holder. But again, it really depends on your boat setup um, and if you've got a console versus a tiller. And again, we're talking longevity over the course of a day. There might be a certain pass that you may uh, opt to, to uh, you know, hold the rod and there, be, there may be uh, certain passes when you're over open water that you say, hey, I don't need to hold the rod. And when I'm running clean over 40, 30, 40, 50 feet of water, you know, do I need to hold my rod out there in the abyss? Probably not. So that's when I start to use a rod holder. Also, when I'm using planer boards with multiple anglers in the boat, uh, rod holders are really beneficial in that regard. And I could really go into more detail on that, but that's my basic answer to that question. Okay, this next question is from Jason. And, and this is, I'm really passionate about this question. He, typed, he, he wrote in and said, hey, anything over 2.6 miles per hour and my crankbaits are coming to the surface. Just wondering what the max speed is for a depth rater. Well, first of all, a depth rater that is running true should easily be able to run on a dime. And I'm sorry, by the way, that I'm not using, uh, I, I should put uh, some of John Seeger's amazing magnets up here. I'm sure we're gonna get to uh, some, some drawings, some musky drawings here, but just for now, I'll put up some of these fantastic magnets. But let's get back to the question. I feel bad I'm not, I'm not uh, drawing anything, but these are some great Q&A questions. I've been excited to do this for a while now. So again, what, what I wanted to say is this, depth raters will run five miles per hour or better. So super fast speeds for trolling. Usually our upper echelon of, of speeds in the musky world seems to be like six, six and a half miles per hour. I mean, some folks may troll faster than that. I don't personally, just because I don't feel that I need to. It's pretty pretty quick. Um, but again, there's, there's applications for that and I'm sure folks are doing that. Uh, but again, depth raters should be able to, to um, attain a, a straight running depth and straight line on a, on, a, uh, on a trolling pass and be upwards of five plus miles an hour. If you guys and gals out there are trolling and you, you get over two and a half miles per hour and your lures are coming out of the water, what we're talking about here is a tuning issue on the lure. It's not that the lure can't uh, you know, be trolled at that speed. It's a tuning issue. So now it is time for a picture here. So let me, and again, I'm not gonna do this justice. So JBO and the whole, the whole J, JBO team, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is the, the top half here and something like that. Okay, so this is, the, this is the front. Okay, and here is the diving lip. So I've drawn an exaggerated diving lip here on our crankbait, okay? And there's our there's our depth rater here. I don't know that I need to put the hooks in, but you guys get the point here. Uh, John, I may need actually now magnets of crankbaits because this is obviously terrible. So what you need to know here uh, is if your lures are trolling and they're just flying out of the water, first of all, there is here, and, and a, lot of, a lot of baits have uh, various different, what we call line ties here. And this is the actual, you know, hook that you're hooking your leader up to or your split ring or whatever it is, okay? There is a, an actual metal ring there. We call that the line tie, okay? And if your line tie is off, your lure will run right or left. So I'm gonna make a little, you know, uh, that's not a, good, not a good R there. If I was teaching, I'd erase that right away. Okay, so here we go. So we'll right, left, okay? So here's an old T-chart here. And here's what, here's what we're gonna do, okay? 
If your lure is running to the right, so if you cast it out or you're trolling and your lure is tracking to the right, okay, so tracking right, um, bend, line tie, left, okay? If you're running, if your lure is running to the left, bend, right, okay? And that is really all it is to it, okay? So, and you're probably gonna ask, well, how do you do that? There's a variety of different things that you can use. I use an actual lure tuner. If you go on any of the main, um, you know, tackle manufacturers and, or websites or big time, um, you know, I don't know, if you even go into your local tackle shop, you'll find these. What I use is an actual, I, I believe JBO uh, still makes this, but I'm not entirely sure. It's called, it's just called, it's called a lure tuner. Lure tuner. Um, but you actually don't even need a lure tuner, okay? And what I'm doing with this lure tuner, and, and I'm, I'm literally bending the line tie either, if it's running, if I'm tracking to the right, I'm bending it to the left. If I'm tracking to the left, I'm gonna bend it to the right. Now, again, when I say bend, please, and those of you who, who are familiar with tuning lures, you know when I say bend, we don't mean bend, okay? I mean slightly tap it to the right or to the left. You can very easily find yourself in a situation where you are going one way or the other way. So again, I'm not gonna go into further detail on this because I could probably do an entire vlog on tuning lures. And hey, in this new Q&A format, if you guys want me to do a, a Q&A on tuning a lure, which we can really go into depth on uh, in detail, Let's do it. By the way, Jason, the last thing I'll say, oh, and I, I just said you could use anything. As long as you can maneuver that line tie, you can use pretty much anything from um, a needle nose pliers, any pliers that you're unhooking muskies with, as long as it's got a fine enough beak on that pliers that you can adjust that line tie, it should be fine. A lure tuner, uh, what that is, by the way, if you've never seen one, you can probably Google it. It's just a, it's just a metal, um, uh, I don't know. It's just a just a it's just a piece of metal with a divot in it, okay. And that little divot there, okay, fits over the line tie, and that allows you to adjust it right or left. One word of caution, by the way, and this is a huge one. Again, we could go a whole vlog on this, Jason. Another thing you got to be careful of is is your line tie solid, okay? A lot of times you get a big muskie in the net, or you snag a fish crib, or a rock, or whatever, and you can shake that line tie a little loose out of the plastic mold, okay? It doesn't mean it's gonna come out, but it's a little loose. You gotta get some serious um, super glue gel and gel these for a couple days and, and strengthen that again before you tune it. Otherwise, it can be nearly impossible to tune a depth rater with, where the line tie is loose. So keep that in mind if you're having running issues. Okay, next question here is from Rod. This is a great question. Is there a better time or weather, weather pattern uh, than others to trolling? And I think that's a really good question. First of all, I think that you, you could arguably say no, essentially, that if, you, if, the, if the trolling bite is hot, you better be trolling when you're in a good weather phase, okay? If, if the casting bite is hot in, in certain situations, I would not be trolling when the weather is prime. So under prime weather, under a prime moon phase, you got to be listening to the fish, whether that's listening to your electronics, where are those muskies located? So when I'm trolling, I'm trolling when I feel that that is my best application to catch the muskies, if you will. I'm trolling even under prime weather conditions, prime moon phases, because I feel that trolling will give me the best chance to catch a muskie or m multiple muskies, okay? So, so to, to a certain extent, you know, if, if your muskie, if you're, if, sorry, if your lure is in the strike zone and you're, and you're around muskies and the, and the weather is good, you're going to catch them trolling. If you're trolling and the weather is great, but the muskies aren't really where you're trolling, obviously you're going to catch nothing or very little muskies. So uh, I would say this though, there is definitely a weather pattern uh, for me when trolling is, is uh, very important. And that would be when the, when the casting bite and the shallow bite sucks. Let's just face it. And trolling has absolutely, I, I, I know there's, there's you know, probably guide clients out there listening to this say, yeah, that was me, man. Yo, Chaz, dude, remember when we caught that fish? We didn't see a musky for eight hours. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm talking about that. When I'm guiding and we don't see a musky for eight hours and, and they're like, dude, what, what should we do? Uh, 
hey, sometimes trolling is, is a really, really effective option because look, when the casting bite sucks, you got to do something else. And if you keep banging your head on the chalkboard and you keep casting at muskies that aren't responding in the shallow weeds or shallow rocks, look, get out there and do some trolling. You've just got to take the chance and do it. So that would be my answer to that question. Okay, uh, guys, the, the amazing architect that, that designed these awesome magnets has asked a lot of questions. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go through John's questions here. And this is a question that uh, my, my dear friend and, and guy client Wally had too. Drag setting uh, when holding the rod versus putting it in the rod holder. Okay, so drag setting. Okay. Um, I don't set my drag, well, I guess I should, I do actually set it a little differently now that I say that. Drag sitting in general is a two-person task, okay? One person needs to be at the seat of the reel. One person needs to be holding the leader, or I will just say this because there's people, I don't want people to get hurt, a lure with no hooks on it. Or if you're holding a, a lure with hooks on it, make sure that you've got a a leather uh, working glove or something so you don't hurt yourself, okay? But you need one person on the on the business end down where the actual leader and lure are. You need one person on the reel. The person on the uh, lure side, and, and, and Joe Booker and I really uh, did a lot of this uh, when Joe got pulled over the, uh, <laughs> the bow of his boat by, I believe it was Tyson the Muskie. Joe got pulled over because his drag was was way too tight and this, this 52, 53 inch Muskie just pulls Joe overboard. And we said, you know what? There's got to be a better way, and there is. The better way is setting the drag with two people. One person, again, is holding that, that, uh, that lure, and it's, you're pulling it from the, 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 uh, where the, where the muskie is going to be pulling from, from the rod tip, okay? And you're pulling it, and you're, you're going to tell your partner, nah, you know, you know, Bill, crank it up, a couple clicks, a couple clicks tighter. And then you're going to pull it again and say, no, nah, Bill, one more, one more click tighter. And you're going to pull it again, and you say, one click less, too much. That's how I am setting my drag, okay? It's a two-person job. Once I have it set like that, I really try not to mess with it for a while. I will test it with my buddies. I test it with, I show clients all the time. This is how you properly set a drag. Uh, that's one of the first things that I show uh, customers, especially if they're new to musky fishing. Uh, it's one of the most important 101 things. That drag setting, I'll just say this, it's tough to give a uh, uh, quantitative like value to this, right? Um, that drag setting that I use for casting, I will usually back off of that for trolling by, let's just call it two clicks, maybe three clicks. If I've got a rod now, okay, so that's for holding the rod. I'm going to back off a couple of clicks for, for trolling, okay? Be because when you snag something, and I don't show this, and I was, I was, I'll, I will try to find a, a video of this. When you snag something, and it happens all the time. You do not want to A, break your line, B, get the rod pulled out of your hand, C, something breaks, okay? So and that's that would happen, okay? So if your drag is set just right, you're just gonna go, oh, and it's just gonna be stripping line real slowly. And if, they, if it doesn't start shaking, it's not a musky, right? Now, if I've got a rod in a rod holder, how do I set my drag? Even a little lighter than that, and the clicker's on, okay? So if a musky grabs that, I'll usually hear it, you know, you'll, You'll, and a lot of times you'll just hear that rod holder buckling and popping around a little bit. Um, so I, I definitely back off on the drag, okay? A couple other questions from John here. These are great questions. Does your trolling pass depend on wind direction, speed, or current? Absolutely it does. When we're talking about trolling speed, okay, the wind can be your friend or your foe. And it can be your friend. When I've got a heavy wind and I got people looking at me in the bait shop like, oh man, this is gonna suck today. I'm sitting there going, oh yeah, I know. And I'm secretly thinking, oh, this is gonna be awesome. This is perfect. I love it. I love trolling in heavy wind with an asterisk because it actually can get too windy, right? Uh, but wind is, a, is your number one way, in my opinion, um, at least where I do my trolling on the smaller inland waters. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking inland waters. Those of you who are fishing Green Bay, this is a whole different ball game, okay? But on my inland waters in Wisconsin that are usually 4,000 or less acres, you know, give or take 5,000 acres or less that I'm focusing on, pretty small in comparison to what a lot of folks are fishing uh, in the Great Lakes, obviously. But uh, wind is a, is a huge help in slowing down my trolling pass, okay? My old Evan Rudy Tech. Uh, knock on wood, you know, she's still kicking. Uh, I don't have a feature where I can slow my 
my RPMs down like a lot of these newer engines, which is really cool. So I use the wind to slow me down. I also use the wind to speed me up though. If the trolling, if, if the muskies are responding to a faster bite, I control with the wind. And, and I can I can really, uh, you know, zig and zag and move and this and that. So trolling uh, with the wind to slow me, or sorry, with the wind to speed things up when I want to, which a lot of times in the summer I do, even in the fall occasionally, okay, when I'm, you know, hey, I'm experimenting all the time. And, but especially the wind is helpful to, to slow things down. And are you making multiple passes in opposite directions is, is uh, another question that John's asked here. Absolutely. I mean, if I am confident, it's just it's, it's just like casting a reef. If I'm confident the muskies are on a reef when I'm casting, I'm gonna take multiple passes on that darn reef, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna fish it at different moon phases. I'm gonna fish it in different weather phases. I'm gonna fish it all day long. The same goes for trolling. If I'm on a good trolling pass, I'll troll it this way, I'll troll it that way, I'll troll it deep, I'll troll it shallow. I'll, I'll work, the, I'll work the, the, the living you know what's out of it to see if I can catch a muskie holding there. So that's very important. Uh, yes. And um, John, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to your, your, your next question here. Um, and this is, guys, John has asked, and, I, and I, I'll have to admit, John, I'm really sorry. I don't have, I couldn't find before I started this, this vlog, uh, a good um, like tight cam shot of my electronics, which I know I took thinking that this question was going to come up. So this will have to be, if, if folks want uh, a trolling uh, Q&A number three, we'll do it. But just the general question, you know, that we'll talk about what do pods of Cisco's look like on your electronics? It's, I guess the way that I would equate it to you is this. If you've, if you've, if you're sucker fishing, drop us, drop a nice size 16 inch or 14 inch sucker down on your side imaging and take a look at that on your screen. That is going to be about the size, at least where I'm fishing. These Cisco's probably range from like 12 inches to maybe upwards, you know, close to 20 inches long, but probably more in that 14 inch to 16 inch range. Um, and, and I guess what I'll tell you is this, John, when I'm looking at my side imaging, right, let's just say this is uh, right and this is left. And uh, we'll just draw the bottom here. So I'm just going to answer this kind of basically, but, um, you know, here here is the um, bottom okay and the same will apply uh, on the left side okay so this is the bottom so when I'm seeing Cisco's you know they're usually showing and these could show up in a variety of different uh, and let's say my depth here is 16 foot okay you have to remember when you're side imaging by the way if you are shooting right 60 feet or left 60 feet obviously here you have to take into consideration this depth here okay this depth means you're not truly running 60 foot okay I believe 16 feet of depth means this is 16 okay so you're gonna do 60 minus 16 to give you your actual running depth there okay um, so that is is how, how that's gonna happen right so that's 44 is that correct for um, and that's 10, so I believe that's 44. Um, but let me just double check my math on that. So that's six, nine, 10, and that's four, five, six. Yep, that's 60. Good, I can still do basic math. Awesome, that's, that's really happy. Anybody, that, anybody out there that's, uh, that's uh, son or daughters in my science class, you saw it right there. I can still add a couple numbers together. So this is gonna be your 16 foot here, and this is gonna be your shooting uh, 44 feet. So when you're, that's something to keep into, take into consideration, okay? But again, what do these things look like? These Cisco's, if you will. Well, again, they're usually and they'll they'll show up individually. Sometimes they'll show up in groups. But these guys, you know, they're they're usually they're they're just showing up. You can you can some they show up like this. They're fairly large, and and you'll see big packs of them, right? And you know, sometimes there'll be some down here. Okay, um, so that you know that's kind of what they're showing up on on, on my side imaging. And now let me just differentiate that on the other side here with what do smaller things look like? You know, a lot of times I'm seeing stuff that's like this. Those are not Cisco's, okay? Those are juvenile perch, those are bait fish, different minnow species. So your Cisco's are really showing up much larger. And uh, again, you only know this by snagging them. Sometimes you run through little pods of, of bait and I snag different things. And uh, 
you know, so, so that's kind of hopefully, uh, John, a little bit of an answer. I will try to get a screenshot for you and, and kind of we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, now, uh, Nick asks, as we move on here, Nick asks another question, what is bottom bouncing? I'm gonna give a very basic uh, answer. I, I don't know that he actually asked what bottom bouncing is. I don't think he did, but he, he did ask about bottom bouncing and I think it would be important to kind of uh, talk to everybody about bottom bouncing and what it is. So here we're gonna draw the bottom content of a lake and we'll draw in, you know, maybe some, some rocks, okay? Something like this. And uh, my, my nickname in uh, college was, uh, <laughs> was uh, never, I'm, I'm actually forgetting the guy's name. Um, oh my gosh, who's the famous painter? I can't remember right now. Uh, I can't remember the name. Somebody's, somebody's gonna say it in the comments. Um, I watch him actually quite frequently. So here's some rocks on the bottom. I'll think of it before, the, before our vlog is over here. Bottom bouncing is, is simply, this, okay? Bottom bouncing is running your crankbait, or it really could be a, a number of different lures, could be a, um, the, and this, this, this technique applies during the summer, during the spring, during the fall, it could be a, a JB Rattler, could be a depth raider, could be a shallow raider. Uh, this could be shallow, deep, in between, doesn't matter. Bottom bouncing is bottom bouncing. What bottom bouncing is, we're talking trolling, okay? Um, is when you are running your lure, okay? So let's say, here's our boat. Okay, here's, here's me and a big whiskey there trolling along, okay? And, and you're running so that your lure, okay, is ticking the bottom, okay? It's actually ticking along the bottom. And, oh, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> I was thinking, Bob, guys, my, my girlfriend, Stephanie, thank God, she, she's amazing. Um, and her first muskie catch is coming up in season four, by the way, which is gonna be amazing. It is gonna be so fun. Bob Ross, nobody, my, <laughs> my nickname in, in college was never Bob Ross. I also never had as no, enough hair, uh, never had as much hair as Bob Ross. So um, anyway, bottom bouncing is when your lure is knocking into the bottom, okay, as you troll along. What you need to keep in mind here, and, and why is bottom bouncing effective? Well, why is hitting a piece of wood uh, with your crankbait in the spring effective? Why is making contact with the weed cover um, in June and July effective. Why, you know, these, these are, well, contact with the cover always is, is a great way to trigger strikes, okay? So that's why bottom bouncing can be so effective. It can also uh, be not so effective. You know, they're, you know, first of all, if you've got muskies that are holding high, and I'm getting off topic here for a second, but if you've got muskies that are holding higher up in the water column and you're bottom bouncing, well, guess what? You're, you're trolling below the muskies. And these muskies are probably not gonna be looking downward because their eyes uh, are positioned here. Their eyes are like looking this way, okay? I mean, they're looking maybe this way, probably not like this. Okay, so you have to keep in mind, you're like, oh man, you know, Chaz, I, I'm not bottom bouncing all of the time, okay? I'm bottom bouncing when I feel that the muskies are cover tight, they're bottom tight, okay? Uh, but you also need to keep in mind, look, you can't be dredging the bottom and looking for every hat and boot that ever fell in your lake, okay? Because you can very easily have too much line out and you can be just, just raking the bottom and your lure is gonna be snagged constantly. So you have, to, uh, you have to work on finding the amount of line for the speed that you're trolling that's gonna allow you to tick properly and not just dredge the bottom of the lake, okay? Now, moving on. I got a couple more questions here. Okay, um, a question from Wally. Do you recommend line counter reels? If not, what's the best way to determine how much line you have out? That's an awesome question. Yeah, I totally, Wally, recommend getting some line counter reels. There are some fantastic, I mean, I, I'm usually running some old Abu Garcia. I mean, these are like the old C4s. Um, I run, I mean, I've had them for a long time. They, they catch fish for me. They still function properly. I haven't needed to replace them yet. Again, knock on wood. I'm uh, not trying to be too superstitious here, but I, but they seem to be working still. I think the most important thing, by the way, is your fishing line. That is something I do not compromise on. When it comes to trolling, you know, you can get away with some, some older reels, I think, that maybe you've taken out of the pack from casting. And, and I think we've all done that. You can save a little dough and, and use some of your old reels for trolling. Why is a line counter reel effective? Well, in the words of Tom Geld, I can't quote him, but exactly in his book, Muskie Strategy, is the, the old, and I know Buck Perry's the godfather of trolling, 
But uh, I always look to Tom Gelb uh, in Vilas County and, and Joe Booker, of course, a lot of these, these wonderful, these, these great pioneers. But uh, I was just recently rereading um, Musky, uh, Musky Strategy by Tom Gelb. And, you know, I think in, in those first couple chapters, you're, you're, you're talking in a scientific term about replication. Like any lab experiment, if you're going to replicate something and you're to replicate it well, a line counter reel really allows you to make precision running depth decisions, make, make precision, precision running depth passes. That's where the line counter reel is important. You're not second guess. You're not wondering, well, is it 50 or is it 55? Because let me tell you, there's a difference between 50 and 55. There's a major difference between 60 and 75 or 60 and 70. Like 10 foot is, is are you dredging the bottom or are you running clean? Or are you five feet off the bottom and the muskies are on the bottom? So that's where the line counter reels come into play. And uh, if you're serious about musky fishing, I'd highly recommend, uh, and if you're watching this, I'm sure you are, because uh, nobody would listen to a 40 minute vlog uh, if you weren't serious about musky fishing. So uh, if you don't have a line counter reel and you want to get out and troll this fall still, what can you do? Well, what I would highly recommend doing is you take your reel, and again, this is, this is Mr. Martin here is not Bob Ross, okay? So here is your level wind, okay? This is your little, uh, your little piece on the reel in front of the spool. Okay, here's the spool with all your fishing line on it, okay? And this goes back and forth, right? What you want to do, okay, is, is what, I, what I've done in the past, is I start this level wind on, on one side, okay? And you will pull out line, and you'll go one, two, three, four, five. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll count off whether it's four or five level wind passes, and I will have usually a, um, a tape measure down on the, on the driveway or something like that, and I can actually then see how many level wind passes it is for me to get to a certain uh, yardage of line. Now again, this, this is actually a pretty, pretty good way to do this, okay? So, and, and I don't have any of the numbers off the top of my head because it's been a long time since I've done this, but it, it works. So you can say, oh, okay, um, you know, four level wind passes is 20 feet. Eight level wind passes is 40 feet. And you can kind of estimate like that. Uh, and you can also mark on your line with a Sharpie marker as well. So every 10 foot, you can, you can black it out with a Sharpie. And uh, that can also help you keep track of your amount of line you've got out there. Okay. And um, let's see here. We talked about rod holders. How do I know if there's a bite? You know, if you're feel, if you're, if you're, you should set your drag such so that a muskie is able to not just take your line out all willy nilly. It's one of Wally's last questions, but uh, that it, it, it's just a fine line between, it's gotta be able to pull some of that drag up. Please folks, if you're listening to this still, don't set your drags from the reel. Do not pull your line from the reel and say, oh yeah, that's tight. It is not tight. I will pull it from the rod tip and just rip it on out. Okay, a 24 inch northern will rip all that line out. Setting your drag from the rod tip from the, from the reel is a bad idea. Always set it from the tip of the rod, okay? And the last question is from Adam is, and we had some conversation about this, and I'll just say, you know, he was talking about uh, having difficulty setting multiple lines, multiple uh, planer boards, and, you know, getting tangled. And he was talking about, I believe, setting like four or five lines, maybe six lines, I'm not sure uh, where he's fishing. Uh, but again, always check your regulations to make sure you're legal on the number of uh, lures and lines you're allowed per person, per boat, okay? Uh, but he's talking about, how do I do this without getting tangled? There's a couple really easy ways to do this. The way that I have done this when I'm trolling multiple boards with, with folks in the boat is to set, especially when it's windy, because he said, hey, look, when it's windy, my boat's going left, my boat's going right, I keep it in gear and it's it's going different ways. The best way to do this is to, that I found personally, and again, this is this is not the Chaz Knows Everything show. This is the this is the Chaz Sherry is Insights show, okay? And uh, I, I appreciate all of you for, for appreciating my thoughts because it means a lot to me. What I have found is that using your trolling motor and putting it on a low speed, if you've got some of the new iPilot features, which you would need to do this, set it at one mile per hour and, and lock it in on a certain GPS coordinate or a certain direction and have that start moving the boat really slow. And then you can set all your boards and all your lines, even if it's, and, and so that's one way that I've really uh, done it with, with uh, quite a bit of effectiveness. If you're by yourself and you're setting multiple lines, use your trolling motor if you've got a smart trolling motor to do that, okay? 
Uh, the other thing I would say is, look, if you're having trouble setting that many lines, just don't set that many lines. Start basic and build your way up. And I think that's one of the most important things to think about in this sport with anything is, you know, a lot of folks said, hey, and I'm so happy about this. A lot of folks said, hey, Chaz, I'm taking your, your challenge. I'm going to troll in 2021. Start basic. Start with one rod, one reel. Get a lure that you are comfortable with and, and, and test it from there, okay? Don't dive in and say, all right, Chaz gave me my trolling challenge. I'm going to, I'm going to buy everything. Ease your way into it. Ease your way into it. Okay, so guys, there we have it. I could talk to you all night, but I know Stephanie wants to cook some dinner here and get things going because it's kind of late. And it's actually kind of funny. We both did webinars tonight. She's doing webinars for um, dietetics and I'm doing webinars for muskies. Uh, so, hey, doesn't get much better than that. We're having a great time. I hope you folks are enjoying these vlogs. I can tell from the comments and the enthusiasm that I think you are. And that really makes me happy because they're, they're long and they're not for the faint of heart. Um, and I think, again, Please leave, if we want to do uh, Trilling Basics user Q&A, take three. If you feel, hey, Chaz, really, I want to go in. You kind of talked about this. Let's go into detail on this. Whether it's you name it, put your, your question in the comments section, and we will talk about it, okay? And um, another thing that, like I said, just keep in mind that this winter, and maybe sooner than that, I'm going to open it up. If you haven't checked out the community page on the Muskie Master YouTube channel, check it out. Usually each week, I'm at least making one post on the community page to promote a video, let you know what's going on, kind of some behind the scenes type stuff. Um, sometimes I'll do a poll or something. What I will probably start doing is asking folks, what do you want to hear about? I might put that on my other social media platforms as well. I might just use the Muskie Mastery YouTube thing because that's where you guys, you guys are watching it. You're on my channel. Let's use the uh, community page. So there you have it, folks. User Q&A. Trolling Basics, I hope that you uh, got your question answered. If not, we'll do another one. And also feel free to e uh, email me, reach out on Facebook, Instagram. Um, you know where to find me. If I don't get back to you right away, I promise I will at some point. Um, you know, with, with teaching and we're doing remote learning right now, things are pretty busy, but uh, I always love finding time. And I do find time, believe me, but I always love taking time for you folks and taking time for the Muskie Mastery community. It is uh, really something special in my life, and I'm so glad that all of you have been with me, many of you, for, for many, many years. Um, I'm so glad that uh, you guys have been with me and so supportive along the way. I really appreciate it. So hope you enjoyed this segment, and as always, thanks for watching.